Lots of talk about the end of the age. Lots of talk about doomsday. Lots of talk about catastrophic things and events happening, could happen, are happening, right? And of course, we talk a lot about that here on Stand Firm. Talk about things scripturally that are coming. But I guess because I have no life, one day I watched a whole marathon of Nat Geo's uh, show Doomsday Preppers. I think it's been a few years ago since it's been on. Is it may catch it if you if you caught it? I'd love to hear for you in the links. Really cool, interesting show. Uh, but it would they would follow these doomsday prepping families around, see what they were doing, evaluate what they're doing. And again, because I guess I don't have a life, I spent a whole day, I think two days, like a weekend watching this marathon. I just got hooked. I just got zoned in. So every 30 minutes, a new family, a new prepping situation, a new doomsday. What's crazy is everybody had a different doomsday. Everybody. So somebody's preparing for a nuclear nuclear war and they've got a, a nuclear bomb shelter. Somebody's uh, preparing for a great gas shortage. Others are preparing for a chemical, biochemical breakout. Some are uh, preparing for zombies. Everybody had something different. In every show, it was something different. Unfortunately, somebody's going to be wrong. And it got me thinking. Now, I think it's wise to physically prepare in some way. I'm, I'm not knocking that. But if you're going to do that, let's at least trigger, try to figure out what could happen, right? So as I'm watching that marathon of those Doomsday Preppers, I'm thinking about everybody's got a different one. Who's going to be right? I mean, I'm pretty sure the zombie guy was at the bottom of the list of being right. But whatever the case, and if you're preparing for the zombie apocalypse, I'm sorry, whatever the case is, if you're going to prep, doesn't it make sense to go to a source and try to figure out what is going to happen. What's it going to come down to? Well, I think as believers, we have that. We have that within Scripture, within the Word, within the Bible. We have the truth. And if we include, and because a lot of times it's just the truth and we exclude prophecy, but we include the whole story. We can get an idea of what's going to happen. So we look at the doomsday truth, not just what we're feeling, not just pulling stuff out of thin air, but looking at the doomsday truth about what is actually going to happen. And when we do that, we do find doomsdays or a doomsday with a lot of catastrophic events, right? We find Jesus saying in Matthew 24, there's going to come this time where there's going to be these false leaders, these false messiahs that come, false prophets who are going to deceive people. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars, kingdom against kingdom, nation against nation, earthquake, disease, famine, all of these things, horrific things are going to happen. And then it goes into some very details of the, the sun uh, turning black, the moon turning red. I mean, all these things, the earth shaking, one third dead here, one fourth here, catastrophic things, doomsdays, if you will. But even so, if you took all those things still, what is the ultimate doomsday? So, if we take the very one who gave that list recorded in Matthew 24 of the wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all those things, if we look at what Jesus taught and said, and again, he wasn't pulling that out of thin air, right? Because that's coming forth from the law, the prophets, the history that God had already given that was already in the word. He's just re going back to the prophets and bringing that to the forefront, putting it in order, giving us more details, I guess. But what did he say the ultimate doomsday would be? Was it these wars, rumors of wars? Was it this event with the sun and the moon and the stars? Where did some of these 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 seals and trumpets and bowls that we find in the book of Revelation, what did he say? Well, we get one clue recorded in Matthew 10, 28. Do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus warned about the events that were coming, told us to prepare, told us when you see them, in the city, run to the hills. 
But yet, even though he knew and taught these physical things were going to happen, he said, don't be afraid of those people, those things, those events, those doomsdays that could hurt you physically. Worry about what could destroy your soul. And when we talk about our soul, there's ultimately two doomsdays. This first one, if you're a believer, you're going to be like, yeah, I know this, Jake. Hang in there. I want to share something for you. Two doomsdays. Two ultimate doomsdays, and they're right in line. They're, they're very consistently near the same. First, the ultimate doomsday, when we're talking about the soul. We find in Revelation 20, the great white throne of judgment, as it's called. Judgment. That's the doomsday. If we look back in the prophets, if we re go through the Old Testament, the driving force was that one day there would be a judgment. And not, not a judgment physically, I don't want to exclude physically, but a, a, a all encompassing, all parts of us, body and soul, judgment. That doomsday judgment. Revelation 20, 15 says, Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the fire, lake of fire. This is it. Revelation 20 then describes this, this great scene. I want to read you in context this Revelation 20 scene, but still zeroing in this, on this verse 15. Revelation 20, we read of this ultimate doomsday of both body and soul. Verse 11, it says, Then I saw, and this, so this is after the millennial kingdom that we've talked about, after the rebellion Satan brings again after he's let loose. Before the earth is made new, we read, Then I saw this great white throne and him who was seated on it. Earth and sky fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing on the throne. The book were open. Another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were court, judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up the dead that were in them. The death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. If anyone's name is not written, found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Every living person. And it seems to be everyone's received this resurrected body because if this is happening after the millennial kingdom, the believers before Jesus came have these resurrected eternal bodies. But then right preceding this, it talks about the dead. I mean, the lost who were in this place of torment uh, being resurrected. So however that plays out, all of us going before the Lord and there being judgment coming down to one thing. Was our name written in the book of life or not? Had we followed Christ or not? You know, whatever phrase we want to use. Typically, we'd say, were we saved or not? Were we born again or not? I think because we've watered down those so much, I like to use, did we accept the invitation to follow and place our belief in Christ or not? Did we accept his sacrifice or not? That's what it all boils down to. The ultimate doomsday isn't a Worldwide nuclear war. It isn't zombies, a zombie apocalypse. As scary as that might sound. And as I was watching, begin watching my weekend marathon of the Doomsday Preppers, inside I'm just screaming about because people were devoting their whole lives to building these bunkers, turning their pools into tilapia farms. They showed one teenager who was missing prom and everything in his teenage years so he could prepare and get good with a bow staff so he could be ready for zombies. All of this. And inside of me, it's just screaming out. That verse. 
Don't worry about those who can hurt the body physically, but worry about what can happen to the soul. And ultimately, there's two eternal destinations for our soul. Heaven or hell. And as we've, if you've followed us here or you can go to our teaching code, heaven is better than we can imagine. There's a lot more to heaven than just simply saying heaven, right? Now it's being in the, the, the presence of Christ. However that works, it must be in, brought back, enjoying the millennial kingdom, and then enjoying the new heaven and new earth for eternity versus our souls being in a place of torment and then ultimately being thrown in this lake of fire. That's the doomsday. That lake of fire. Name not written in the book of life. How does our name get there? By accepting the offer Jesus made when he died on the cross for our sins. While we were still, Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I encourage you to dive into this more in Luke 16, verse 19 through 31, where we find the rich man and the Lazarus. And Lazarus, Jesus is giving this parable. And through this parable, we get some insight to these two divisions. The rich man, because he did not humble himself and accept the Lord, ends up in this place of torment. The beggar, Lazarus, because he did, we find him in paradise. And we find this great gulf separating the two. So that's the ultimate judgment. But imagine if you've tuned into this channel, for the most part, you've made that decision. You would say your name is in that book. But yet, your soul is still in danger. There's another judgment. We read this judgment called the Judgment Seat of Christ, or the Bema Seat of Christ. Which debate over exactly what that Bema seat was. Is it more like a court or is it, I think many point back to like the Olympic podium. It's a reward for faithfulness. Whatever it is, all of us, followers of Christ, if our name is in that book of life, we will go before Christ and it says he will look at what we did with our lives. The question is, were we faithful or not? Another parable in Luke 19, the parable of the 10 minas, very similar to a, a parable you're probably mostly familiar with in Matthew 25, the parable of the talents. I like the insight that we get here in Luke 19 in this parallel, very similar parable. The parable says, a man of noble birth, so this is verse 12, a man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then returned. So he called 10 of his servants, gave them each, or gave them a mina, so gave them 10 minas, put this money to work, he said, until I come back. But his subjects hated him and sent a delegation after him to say, we don't want this man to be our king. He was made king, however, and returned home. Then he sent for the servants to whom he had given the money to find out what they had gained from it. So Jesus tells this parable explaining about Really, what's going to go down? This is a, a parable that's very close to the chest. Jesus says, there's this guy of noble birth who came to a country where he's going to be king, was here for a bit, then left, but he's going to come back and be king. Sounds like someone Jesus knew very well, right? Himself. And then he brings to himself these servants. It gives the number 10. Now, he had more than that, right? 11 faithful ones by the time he ascended. We believe at least 120 Believers at that point, if not more, pretty soon into that, we're picking up 3,000. It's several servants. Each of these servants, he gives a mina. Now, mina is, it was a form of currency, an amount of currency. It's believed to be like an average, like three months salary. It's a pretty, pretty big chunk of change, you know. He gives them three months of an average salary and hands it to them. Goes away. Comes back. As king, calls the ten servants up. See what they had done. Verse 16, the first one came and said, Sir, your mina has earned ten more. So he took what was given to him on behalf of the king, on behalf of the master. And he gained ten more. Well done, my good servant, his master replied. 
Matthew 25, it says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Because you've been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of 10 cities. And I think this connects the millennial kingdom, but that's not the focus right now. The second came and said, sir, your mina that you gave me earned five more. His master answered, you take charge of five cities. Then another servant came and said, sir, I, here's your mina. I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. You take out what you do not put in, reap what you did not sow. And his master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I was a hard man taking out what I did not put in, reaping what I did not sow. Why then didn't you put my money on deposit? So at least it would have collected interest. Then he said to those standing by, take his mina away, give it to the one who has 10. Sir, he already has 10. He replied, and I tell you that everyone who has more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. So that was three of the servants. Check out what happens to the, the rest of the seven. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. A lot of details there. And we have some teaching. You can go find our, our teaching on the, the Stand Firm Conference Sessions 1 and 2 where we go into details about this parable. But the heart of it is, as believers, we will stand before the Lord. And I tell you what, our faithfulness matters. You're probably here saying, yeah, Jake, duh, I, I know that. Well, Jesus gave another warning in Matthew 24. In the mix, you know, I was saying, Jesus said all these physical things are going to happen. These doomsdays are going to happen. These catastrophic events are going to happen. He said all that. But yeah, elsewhere recorded in Matthew, he said, don't, don't fear the physical. Fear what can happen to your, both the body and soul. But listen to this warning he gives in the mix of laying out these catastrophic events. Matthew 24, 10, he says, At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. Now, he's talking about a very specific time, I believe happens at the, the hands of the deception of the Antichrist and persecution brought on by these end-time events. But it's a warning that has stood true throughout the ages. This warning is to believers. Jesus speaking, these things are going to happen. But you need to know at that time, many are going to turn away. Remember, we read, don't be afraid of what can happen to the physical body. This is in reference to when persecution breaks out and difficulty happens. He says, when things are more difficult than they've ever been on earth, and when our my people are facing persecution, many will turn away. They'll give up. They'll walk away. This word many means the majority. This is the warning, and this is the doomsday. Ultimately, the doomsday is where your soul is. Now, I think this has some bearing and some reference to that, but, at the, but I know there's much debate about that. So let's just say at a minimum. This means at least an aspect of this turning away. Some parts of it means you walked away from, from the Lord completely. Some of it may be a momentary lapse. That leads to being, when you're before the Lord, as we just read, you're found unfaithful. You don't hear the words, well done, my good and faithful servant. This is a doomsday of the soul. This is a spiritual doomsday. So we need to know our faithfulness to God matters. Listen, I mean, again, the ultimate doomsday is our name in the book of life or not. But if we've trusted Christ as our Savior, we need to realize our soul is still in danger. Are we going to be found faithful or not? Are we going to be faithful when challenges and difficulties come? And the track record, we're not even to that main time that it's talking about. And many, 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 many have already walked away. So I, I taught, began teaching on this in 2012. Begin writing and teaching. Things are going to happen to our church as we know it, to our nation. And it's going to cause a challenge in our faith, and many could turn away. We need to prepare. Again, many didn't listen to me too well, and I definitely wouldn't have drawn it up and seen it as what happened with COVID. But before COVID, the numbers were 
disastrous of those who have walked away from the church and especially even more so walked away from the faith. But since COVID, it's astronomical. It now, it's not sealed yet. Hopefully there's a chance many are going to come back. But we need to know. It's not just, hey, I'm saved, I'm good. I got my eternal vacation set up. No, it's, it's not just it. We're called to faithfully follow the Lord. And believe me, when we see him, we want to be. Listen, I think we, we're just happy to get to heaven by the skin of our teeth. And listen, we get to our, we get to heaven, we get to the age to come far, far less than the skin of our teeth. We get there by nothing we do other than placing our faith in Christ who died for our sins. He did it all. We don't do nothing. But he's called us to be faithful. And I promise you, I guarantee you, I give, I would give all that I could for us, for you to understand and put it on the line and say, listen. I guarantee you, when you see the Lord, you're going to want to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Your faithfulness to God matters. The thing is, we need to realize that we just read every day, day in and day out, right now and coming even more so in the future, our faith is going to be challenged. And as we just read, it's not just our neighbor that could turn away. It's not just little so-and-so. It's me and you. We could turn away. Many already have, and we need to make a commitment that when difficulty comes, we need to see the fork in the road of faith. Listen, I've had so many conversations as a pastor where someone would say, you know, pastor, I used to go, used to, go to your church, and you, you know, it used to be about that Jesus thing, and then my grandfather passed away, and man, I couldn't understand how God would let that happen. Jake, I, I, you know, I used to be faithful to the Lord and, you know, I did all this stuff and believed that stuff. And then I went through a divorce. I just couldn't understand how that could happen. I walked away from the Lord. Jake, you know, I used to go to your church. I, I used to, you know, I helped with the kids. I was faithful. Believed in Jesus. But then someone said this mean thing to me at church. That moment of when those encounters in life happened is a greater doomsday than a nuclear nuclear bomb. Hear me out. What, what do you mean by that is? Listen, doom, the greatest doomsday is not us losing our lives. The greatest doomsday is us turning our soul away from the Lord. Whether that's not accepting to begin with, or whether it's a turn from our faithfulness. It's to give up. It's to walk away. In Hebrews, it talks about those who've come to the Lord and tasted and experienced Him and the Spirit's moved in their life, yet they walk away. That's the greatest doomsday. I beg you, I urge you, stand firm. I think part of standing firm is to, is to realize these things that your faithfulness matters. It's being challenged now. It's going to be challenged a lot more in the future. And we've been warned. We could turn away. Many already have. We need to stand firm. And I think to do that, we have to spiritually prepare. Listen, the ultimate doomsday wasn't in any of those shows I watched in that marathon. It's ultimately Number one, if we trust in Christ or not, that judgment, which is sealed at our death. But then for believers, I think we need to realize the next level of doomsday is each fork in the road of our faith. If we turn away, and I think even momentarily, I know that happens and it's a struggle. Listen, it's a process. We don't have it. When we walk away from the Lord, that is the ultimate doomsday for the believer. That's what you should fear most. Whatever you see in the news, 
This is what you fear the most. It's not how that could hurt you or hurt your pocketbook. It's how that when it hurts you or it's coming your way and hurting your pocketbook, how is that going to impact your faith? That's what matters the most. I had a dear friend having, having this very complicated surgery. And as I prayed with her beforehand, my first prayer was, regardless how this goes, keep this family's faith pointed to the Lord. Now, Lord, I want you to heal. I want you to do this, this surgery to be successful. But the most important thing, more than our physical lives, is our souls. It's our faithfulness to God. That's the ultimate doomsday. Hey, I'm Jake McCandless. This is Teaching Stand Firm. We'd love to connect with you. And I've seen some comments coming in. We're going to record those comments every Friday at noon, except this week. We will remember... 9 a.m. Eastern, but typically noon Eastern, same channel where you're seeing this, our show Talking Stand Firm, where we take all the questions that come in tonight as we're doing this live. We take all the ones coming in there. We dive into them, talk about them, work through them, typically always have a guest and work through that. So join us for Talking Stand Firm. Join us again next week for Teaching Stand Firm on Thursday nights. And really the best way you could connect, and and we would love to help you more because we're here to help you navigate such a time as this there in the notes of wherever you're at, you'll find a link that gets you to uh, our email list. And regularly, I send out just these little snippets just of text, just these, these navigational truths just to help encourage you to keep holding on and be in a spiritual prayer.